So now we'll go to our first guest today, which is Danny Jaffer. Uh, he's representing House District 23. Welcome, Danny. Well, hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Nice. I was, as I was saying earlier, I was, I was really excited to have you on your show. I was born in Dallas, and uh, all my relatives were from that area, and so I have a, a great affection for your district. Well, thanks, thanks. I, I grew up in it as well. I grew up in Monmouth and uh, spent a lot of time up and down the, that part of the Mid-Valley. Uh, eventually went to Oregon State to go to school. So your district is really big. How are how are you managing uh, uh, running your campaign down there? Well, you're right. It's big, and just so folks know, it stretches from just south of Dundee to the which is up near McMinnville to the northwest side of McMinnville. Excuse me, northeast side of McMinnville, all the way down to uh, the Lane County line south of Monroe. Uh, so it, it's taken quite a bit, but we are contacting folks in all of those areas, all the little communities along the way, and uh, doing our best to uh, get to know uh, folks in, in the business world there and the wineries, and uh, we'll reach out to the farmers as well. Uh, so it's, it's taken a lot of footwork, so to speak, although that's probably more mileage than footwork. <laughs> yeah, the, the neighborhood leadership program uh, works well for dense neighborhoods uh, like in Washington County, but it it uh, it breaks down when you get into huge areas of rural Oregon where you cannot walk from door to door. Right. I, you know, yes, there's a lot of this area that's got, uh, um, you know, neighbors who are well over a mile apart, often two or three miles apart. So uh, you're right. It, I could walk it. Uh, I'm I'm a pretty healthy guy, but uh, might take me a while. So, what is your background, and what prompted you to run? Well, so like I said, I grew up in the valley, grew up in this area, so I've just got a you know personal affinity for it. But also, um, you know, my background is I grew up here. I then went to school in the valley at Oregon State. Uh, went into the Navy. Spent uh, about 25 years in the U.S. military. Uh, as a helicopter pilot and fixed wing pilot, uh, served in several different areas and, and spent a lot of time out on the far western Pacific as well as uh, uh, some other places. And uh, came back to this area when I retired and opted to get involved in public service because that's kind of the way I was raised. And, and I've always believed in service, service before self. And so I looked for things to do. i Made a couple of runs at county commissioner in the last uh, eight years. Um, came up just a little bit short the last time, but uh, this particular office, because I'm in this district and I, I really had the feeling that over the last uh, three and a half years or so, uh, there has been scant representation for the folks that live in the area that uh, was up to me to do something about it. And the best thing I could do was get involved in the race. And then it was, apparent that I should be the one who was going to run in the race. So uh, I, at, at this point, you do not have an opponent in the primary, correct? That is correct. And you're, if last time I checked, it looked like you, there were two, re, two Republicans that were going to face off in the primary. Yes. Yes. And that's, to my knowledge, that's still the case. Is, and I forgot to check, is one of them an opponent, the incumbent? Yes. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Nearman is the current uh, state representative and has been since the uh, election in 2014. Um, so are you enjoying the campaign? <laughs> well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. You know, it, it's probably uh, more fun in the early parts than in the later grueling parts, as I've found. But uh, yeah, this has actually been a lot of fun. And, and you know, this is such a beautiful area and, and, and the folks in it are so great that uh, we haven't knocked on a door yet where somebody said they didn't want to talk to us. So. Yeah, you know, one of the greatest things about running a campaign, and, and I would recommend this to just about anyone if they just like to get out, is to, uh, the, one of the greatest things is just meeting people and, and talking with them, talking with them about what they do and, and what they think is important and what kind of things they want to see in their representative. Uh, and just making those acquaintances um, it is really a lot of fun. And, and so, yes, am I having fun in the campaign? Yes, I am. So what? So that, that's interesting that, that they're talking. What are the issues that are, are popping up as being the, 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 the prevailing issues that are of concern to people in your district? Well, prevailing issues are overall, the general ones are, are the same. 
uh, as they are just about anywhere in the state. And that is education is very important uh, because without education, it's tough to, to move off top dead center and, and get things done. Um, the environment is a concern, and that's from all sectors. Um, and uh, some of the very specific important issues in the area, water is one, uh, land use is one, although those are also uh, statewide issues. But uh, those are the kinds of things I want to work on. Veterans issues, uh, a lot of veterans that live in the mid Willamette Valley. I think it's maybe not quite a third of all the veterans in Oregon live in the mid Willamette Valley. So that's a big issue. So all of those issues are, are ones that uh, come up and uh, uh, I'd like to be able to address. And is healthcare also one of them? Oh, sorry. Yes, healthcare is a big one. I'm sorry I missed that one. Thank you for bringing that up. That's actually uh, a, a, one of the very top, top one or two. Um, healthcare, for many reasons, uh, one of them is that, you know, for, for many of the local small businesses we've talked to, uh, the ability to know that their employees can get health care and it might not have to involve the uh, employer coming up with a, a big commitment um, w- would go a long way to, to easing a lot of the issues that small businesses see in the area. There's also, uh, uh, as long as you mentioned that, there's also immigration is a big issue in the, in the district as well. And that has to do with labor issues. Um, there are, well, my opponent is is pushing an initiative that would eliminate sanctuary status in Oregon, which is, you know, Oregon was the first state to establish that 30 years ago, almost no opposition in the uh, <laughs> House and Senate. And uh, and now it's become a, a greater issue uh, for some. Um, I have my personal feelings as to why that is. Uh, a lot of it has to do with just a level of um, lack of education. But uh, the, the big concern with that is that if we start really cracking down, not even cracking down, just making uh, uh, people afraid that uh, our agricultural industries that this district depends on so heavily are going to be impacted in a way that they can't even foresee at this point. Yeah, one of the surprising things about that issue is that, that no one talks about the fact that uh, if 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 we got rid of all the people who currently well not all the people but many of the people who currently work the fields your your head of lettuce is going to be fourteen dollars right right or your bottle of wine is going to be one hundred and twenty dollars yeah and you know it's it's also taking advantage of of uh, you know paying people uh, minimum wages and stuff but but the truth is that the that there's these jobs would go unfilled unless the rate the wages were raised substantially and. Uh, so yeah, there's there's going to be repercussions from this uh, that are going to be wide, pretty wide. Right, right. And a, at least in my conversation with folks in the agri- agricultural community, and particularly in the uh, vineyard and uh, um, uh, orchard industry, the impact is going to be immediate and uh, and crushing in some some cases. So education is a really complex issue, uh, and it's one that, that people have not been able to get their hands around. Do you have any ideas on how to how to address it? Well, yeah, um, you know, we we kind of gave away the way we could control that a number of years ago, and it'd be nice to be able to rein that back in. Obviously, I think that if you talk to most educators in the state and most people that are associated with it, there is a lack and it, However, anybody wants to slice it, there's a lack of funding to, to educate people the way that we want them educated and and to provide those resources that teachers and administrators need to to make that happen, particularly in the K through 12 uh, school, um, but also career technical education uh, kind of went by the wayside for a number of years. It's kind of being there's an attempt to rejuvenate that. And I think that's great. Um, I and also then at the uh, at the uh, um undergraduate level and postgraduate level, the, the costs that are incurred by students, you know, that have to essentially mortgage their future to go to school. Uh, that's an abysmal prospect as we move forward. And if, if people don't recognize the impact that has on our economy and then what that has as an impact on our society, um, then they're really not opening their eyes to the issue. So what can we do? Well, I think that our tax structure really has to be looked at. Um, we need to be able to fund K through 12 in a way that uh, 
you know, you, uh, that uh, the schools can keep class sizes down, that we can keep teachers employed, and that uh, um, makes it possible for students to not have to travel two hours on a bus to get to school. And, you know, that's, uh, let's face it, that's going to cost some money. Um, uh, part of it will be some reorganization, but I think the bigger part of it is that, you know, we've consolidated so much in an attempt to try and reduce costs that uh, that has been detrimental. Uh, and, and then for our, our universities, our community colleges and universities, we need to if we can if we can take the cost of that to some degree off of our K through 12 education. So K through 12 can get the money they deserve uh, by uh, restructuring particular our corporate tax structure so that those people who um, who are benefiting from those you know magnificently trained and educated folks coming out of our uh, uh, universities and and community colleges uh, so that they're paying for it I, I think that would go a long way to helping out the, the situation all the way down to the kindergarten level because now you can take some of that burden that, that the legislature has to take on in order to fund colleges and universities. And, and so I think that um, the biggest issue there is, is just the way we've structured our tra taxes. And, and we need to make sure that the folks that are benefiting from what the state provides are paying for those services, whether it's education or anything else. And healthcare is turning into being a very interesting topic. Uh, when when you talk to people and they they give you their 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 druthers on that, what do you do? You, what direction do you think people are going, and how to fix our current problem? Well, that's a that's <laughs> that's a huge one. <laughs> that is a huge one. Yeah, the issue I think, particularly with uh, healthcare, is that. Uh, um, we we want all of the great things that healthcare can provide. Uh, we we don't recognize what the end cost is, so um, we we want to pretend that somehow everybody can get it and have access to it, and it doesn't affect us. But the reality of it is that when you have a third of your population that isn't covered in some way, that's going to drive up the cost for everyone else. I think the only True answer in the long run is a uh, is a is, is a single payer healthcare system. You know, I'd like to work to get that to that direction. Uh, maybe, you know, it's something that's going to have to be nationwide. Uh, and I know that that can sound scary for a lot of folks, but uh, as a veteran, you know, I'm part of a single payer system, and I can tell you it works really well. Um, and, and that's a, a nice thing, you know, particularly as a as a retired veteran. So. We need to we need to stress that uh, that that if we let people fall by the wayside, that costs us money, and and recognize the fact that uh, at the end of the day, we're our brother's keeper, and healthcare is part of that issue. Did that answer your question? Yeah, um, and it, it's very interesting to hear. Uh, us converging on on the single payer issue. I'm, you know, I've, for all of my life, I've always been extremely healthy. And then, you know, I get old and, you know, your body starts falling apart and you have to start interacting with the system. And and over the past year, I realized how how broken it is. And, uh, and I'm in the, I'm in that, that economic um, uh, area where I get screwed on both sides. I'm not super wealthy and I'm not, you know, emergency room completely without healthcare. And, and it's, uh, it's scary because I don't know how this is going to unwrap in the next coming in the next decade. Right. Right. And, and it's absolutely unfair in my opinion, not just unfair, but just, uh, you know, so inhumane that you have families that go bankrupt because they have to cover healthcare costs in a nation that's got the greatest hospitals and the greatest doctors in the world and ways that these things can be delivered. And, and yet people who have done all the right things all their lives face, you know, massive bills because for whatever reason they didn't have coverage or the coverage didn't cover what they'd hoped it would cover or they thought it would cover or the particular thing that has happened to them or their family. And, you know, that, to me, that's just un-American to, to 
figure that, well, they're, they're on their own. I mean, that's just, that's just not the way that our society and our, our nation should work. And it shouldn't work that way in the state of Oregon. And if we can figure out a way to do it here, and I think we can, because we are one of the most innovative states when it comes to healthcare, and we have some great assets, particularly in the uh, university area, that uh, we can leverage. And I think that uh, if we can crack that, not in Oregon, and then crack it on the West Coast, maybe we can make this a, uh, a plan that goes nationwide eventually. Yeah. Uh, I can't set a timetable on it, but that's certainly something I would want to work on. And I think that my personal feeling is that it, it has to come that way. I mean, I, we have to talk about it. Uh, I've talked with a lot of folks who I would consider are on the other side of the aisle from me in terms of politics, and they say the same thing, that it does need to be talked about. We do need to, to move that direction. And so, Betsy, do, do we have any, uh, any questions coming in from the... Uh, yeah, okay. Phil Britton asked, what prompted Danny to join military initially? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I, it was the whole issue of giving back. My father's an immigrant uh, to this country, and uh, uh, he spent a great deal of time um, raising a family here. I'm the youngest of five children. Uh, and, and, uh, but the, the country gave my father a great place. And uh, we grew up in a great little town. Uh, my dad was a college professor at uh, Oregon College of Education. It's now Western Oregon University. Uh, the idea of service was just something that I was raised with. My mom was a teacher and served on the city council. And so the, just the idea of service uh, was something that we were raised with, but it was also something I took on. And I, I thought there was always a way to give back to everything that we'd gotten and being part of the military was that. Um, I won't deny also that uh, I enjoyed flying and, and uh, as I uh, did some flight training in high school, I knew that I wouldn't be able to afford everything I wanted to do when it came to flying. And the, the Navy offered me that opportunity to, uh, to fly some aircraft that I wouldn't have been able to fly otherwise and, and uh, uh, spend time doing that. But, but really it was about service. It's about you know service before self, and uh, commitment and uh, the honor of doing that. And I'll be absolutely uh, upfront when I say it was an absolute privilege and a pleasure to have, have been a part of the U.S. Navy for those years. Uh, Density McCartney is, what is your point of view on charter schools? I think charter schools have their place. Um, I, I'm not sure that they always meet uh, the criteria that uh, has been set forward for them that may or may not be there falling. I'm not failing. I'm not trying to uh, point a finger at anybody, but I, I think there is a place for charter schools. Uh, I, I don't want to see um, a, a uh, turning away from public schools in general uh, that, you know, some people might think that charter schools can provide uh, so I, I think they have their place. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't close down charter schools, but I do think that, uh, we also need to have the scrutiny that we would have in any, any school. Um, yeah, I, this is a question I have about, uh, I didn't hear you mention housing or homelessness. And so, um, in the area that you represent, is that not an issue? Um, is housing affordable? You have no homeless? Well, we do have homeless in the area. And uh, um, housing is not necessarily affordable for all. That's very true. And I do know that uh, in some of the outlying areas, we end up with uh, um, homeless people that are, are living out in the field or under a bridge. Um, and in, in some of the very small towns that uh, don't have the uh, resources to deal with, with that situation in terms of housing them or sheltering them, that they often try and contract with uh, some of the larger uh, cities, uh, try and make a way for those uh, folks to get there. But it is an issue, uh, and that, um, that the whole problem is nationwide and so it's something we can't ignore in this area uh i you know rents have gone up to a uh, much greater extent that i would have than i would have expected even over the last uh 
five or 10 years. Uh, it makes it very difficult for some people to get into housing. Um, and the number of uh, units for, um, for citizens that happen to have uh, um, income problems or, or uh, you know, large families that, that are trying to deal with this, uh, the places for them to be is quite limited. And so obviously that's something we need to work on. So Julie Love 101 asks, what is, uh, what is his plan for housing the homeless? Well, we need to, to see about how we can establish more sheltering facilities within cities. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, it's not cost effective. And I, I mean that in a very sincere way to try and do that in some of the very small areas, small community areas. Um, it, just because of the numbers and, and the um, uh, locations and, and the, uh, the availability of space. So the, the best thing we can do initially is identify those places uh, in some of the larger areas and, and get people to those places and then work out from there. Um, it, this is not an easy problem and I don't have any easy fixes for that. And I, you know, I'm sorry that I'm a, at a bit of a loss, but the, the reality of it is that uh, um, this is gonna take a very concerted effort by a lot of folks and it's not gonna be something that's gonna be solved in a single legislative session. Uh, and we have to look at the root causes of why people end up being homeless. And a lot of that uh, has not to do with the necessar necessarily the the um, availability of housing sometimes, it has to do with the availability of uh, mental health care. And so not an easy question to answer, quite frankly. I, I want to jump in and say very well done, considering you were put on the spot there to, uh, yeah, there's no simple answer to that. And, and it does tie back into the core issues of income inequality. And so uh, great, great job. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So to, uh, is there any uh, final things you would like to say, Danny, in support of your candidacy? And, and also include, how, how do we throw money at you to support you? Well, great. Thank you very much. And, and sadly, the, uh, <laughs> the truth of any campaign anymore is that it does take uh, money to, to make things work. And, um, we, you know, we have to be cognizant of that. So, uh, you know, my opponent in his last race uh, spent somewhere in the neighborhood of one hundred and fifty to $200,000. I don't anticipate we're going to spend that much, uh, but it'd be nice to have a, enough money to, to, you know, we're, we're in a good position, but we still need to be able to run a real race. And so uh, several ways you get rid of, get rid of me, several ways you get in touch with me uh, or, or the campaign. Um, DannyJaffer.com is the website. And that provides a link to uh, contributions online. Also, uh, vote for jaffer at gmail.com that's the email address it's v-o-t-e number four numeral four jaffer j-a-f-f-e-r at gmail.com and then also we have a campaign number phone number 503-851-0451 um we we've actually been doing quite well uh we uh have been reaching out to folks people have been very positive there are a lot of folks who would like to see a change in this district they feel like they haven't been represented and uh they, they feel like, thankfully, that I'm the guy that can help them out uh, as we go forward to the legislature. We have the wind in our sails, and uh, it's a good year for us. And, and uh, so we're working hard. And if they'd like us to come see them, if we haven't made contact with, with them already, they can give us a call. And, I, and we welcome that. The door will always be open uh, for uh, Representative Danny Jaffer. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you end up being the representative of my hometown, uh, Dallas, Oregon. Uh, have a great day and good luck on your campaign. Thank you very much, Laura. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate the time. Folks, have a great day as well. Bye-bye. Good night.